I want to enlist you in helping to spread a new story about the way humans get things done. We all already know the old story. Biology is war. Only the fiercest survive. Businesses and nations succeed only by defeating, destroying, or dominating competitors. Politics is about your side winning at all costs. But I think I see the first outlines of a new narrative becoming visible in biology, sociology, economics, computer science, mathematics, psychology, and political science. And I've been collecting evidence of this new story, one in which cooperative arrangements, complex interdependencies, and collective actions play a more prominent role and the essential, but no longer all-powerful story of competition and survival of the fittest shrinks just a bit to make room. It started with Smart Mobs, the book I published in 2002. Since 2000, when I started researching that book, I've investigated and documented the forms of social, economic, political, and cultural collective action that the mobile phone, the internet, and the personal computer made possible. That investigation turned out to be just the beginning of my ongoing inquiry into the relationship between technology, media, and social behavior. My interest in the social dynamics of collective action and the possibility that certain technologies can amplify the power of collective action, continued after I finished my book. I began to understand that the co-evolution of media and collective action has been underway for some time. Our primate ancestors left the safety of the trees for the dangers of the treeless African savanna, surrounded by dangerous predators. These were small creatures, our ancestors, about 30 kilograms, and they lacked claws, fangs, wings, or speed. But they were able to communicate and work together on collective food gathering and defense, which eventually made our forebears the most dangerous predators on the savanna. Fully evolved humans roamed as hunter-gatherers in small, extended family units for longer than the 10,000 years we've lived in agricultural settlements. For most of that time, small game and gathered foods constituted the most significant form of wealth, enough food to stay alive. At some point, larger groups figured out how to band together to hunt bigger game. We don't know exactly how they figured this out, but it's a good guess that some form of communication was involved. However they did it, their banding together process must have solved collective action problems. It is unlikely that unrelated groups could hunt mastodons while also fighting with each other. One immediate effect of this new way of hunting must have been the social dilemma presented by sudden wealth. Suddenly, more protein was available than the hunter's families could eat before it rotted. Did those who ate the result of the hunt, but not themselves contribute to the hunt, owe something to the hunters? Social relations must have become more complex in some way, in response to this sudden protein wealth. Undoubtedly, new ways of using symbols were enlisted to keep track of these increasingly complex social arrangements. When growing numbers of humans began to settle and cultivate crops, instead of continuing nomadic hunting and gathering, large-scale irrigation projects 
must have required larger scale social organization. The first empires began to construct cities out of mud bricks. And mud was the first medium for complex human communication that required tools external to the human body. The first forms of writing appeared in the form of marks on clay, used as a means of accounting for commodities, such as wine, wheat, or sheep, and the taxing of those commodities by the empire. The master practitioners of this new medium were the accountants for the emperors and their priest administrators. An elite of priests and several administrators were taught the secret of encoding and decoding knowledge in marks on clay and transmitting this code across time and space. For thousands of years, only this elite were admitted to scribal culture. Then, within decades of its invention, the printing press enabled populations of millions to amplify their thinking by becoming literate. Again, new forms of collective action emerged from newly literate populations. Protestant reformations, constitutional democracies, scientific revolutions, to name three important movements. Martin Luther nailed his famous 95 Theses to a cathedral door at the exact historical moment that printing made widespread distribution possible, and hundreds of thousands of copies were circulated within a decade. The revolutions that replaced monarchies with parliaments and constitutions were based on the public sphere. Literate populations who could discuss and debate issues of self-governance. And instead of relying on geniuses like Aristotle or Newton to come along in order to explain the universe, modern science became a collective knowledge machine that aggregated the observations and experimental results of thousands of literate contributors who published their findings. Again, new wealth was created. Commerce must be ancient, and markets are at least as old as the crossroads. But capitalism is only around 500 years old, enabled by credit networks, stock companies, double-entry bookkeeping, and the books that taught people to do it, and shared liability insurance companies. The global Internet brought the advent of many-to-many -many capability. Every desktop or mobile device linked to the network is now a worldwide multimedia printing press, broadcasting station, place of assembly, potential marketplace. The mobile telephone is in the process of morphing into a wirelessly networked supercomputer in a billion pockets. As I noted in 2002, the most important new technologies will not be hardware or software, but social practices. Understanding these practices early in the history of the new medium could be crucial. Consider two mythic narratives that have emerged to describe social dilemmas, the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons. For the sake of time, I'll set aside the dilemma of public goods. The prisoner's dilemma was the mathematical statement of a fundamental human problem. When two people cannot trust each other or communicate with each other, they are forced to take positions that leave them all worse off than they would have been if they had been able to cooperate. An unsecured transaction is a simple example. You aren't going to send money to someone you don't know in exchange for merchandise you want before you receive the merchandise. Nor would the other party send that merchandise without receiving the money the other party wants. So 
no transaction takes place, and each party is worse off than they could have been. The prisoner's dilemma is actually a story that was overlaid on a mathematical matrix, which came first, in order to make it intelligible to non-specialists. The game theoretic matrix was discovered at the Rand Corporation in the early days of the Cold War to try to rationalize the strategies of two superpowers who did not trust each other, nor did they communicate directly about their strategic intentions. The story goes like this. You and a friend are arrested by the police and held in separate cells. You cannot communicate with one another. If you confess and implicate your friend, and your friend does not confess, then you go free and your friend gets a long jail term. For you, this is known as the temptation payoff, and your, for your friend, it is the sucker's payoff. If you both remain silent and refuse to implicate the other, you both get the shortest possible term. This is the ideal situation for the two of you. But fear of the sucker's payoff would usually cause you to both confess, in which case you both get a longer jail term than you would have received if you had both remained silent. Political scientist Robert Axelrod, who is interested both in the very real dangers of the Cold War and the theoretical question of how cooperation exists at all in a Darwinian universe, created a computer tournament in the 1980s in which he invited people from different disciplines to submit computer programs that execute prisoners' dilemma strategies in a round-robin game. Axelrod ran the different strategies against each other in the computer, and the strategy that won was also the simplest program, just a few lines of code. Always cooperate on the first move. Then, always emulate what the other player did on their last move. This strategy, named Tit for Tat, was entered into a second tournament, and a wider pool of entrants was invited to try to beat it. Tit for Tat won again. However, other cooperation games are not so widely known. For example, the ultimatum game makes a significant reward available to two players. $100, for example, for college students, or, or two days' wages in other societies. Neither player sees the other player or knows the other player's identity. Neither player has played the game before, and neither will play it again. The first player proposes a split. 50-50, or 90-10, or any other proportion the proposer wants to try. The second player accepts the proposed split, in which case each player is paid and the game is over, or rejects the proposed split, in which case nobody is paid and the game is over. Now, the, the basis of modern economic theory is that people act in their rational self-interest. So the rationally self-interested person really ought to take any split offered. Why turn down $10 or $1 simply because you... simply because someone you don't know in another room is getting $90 or $99? Yet, many American, European, and Japanese college students turned down offers less than 50-50, although they had not played the game before, the proposers seemed to know this, making average offers close to 50-50. This startling finding triggered speculation that there is some universally human sense of fairness. Until ethnographers tried the same game on people from more than a dozen very different cultures, from slash-and-burn agriculturalists to pastoral nomads, and discovered that the amount of the offers and the tendency to accept or reject them varies widely from one society to another, which suggests something much more interesting than an innate sense of fairness. It suggests that the sense of fairness is somehow influenced by the culture. People can 
decide what their culture wants to consider to be fair. The second mythic narrative of social dilemmas, the tragedy of the commons, was introduced by Garrett Hardin in a 1968 paper about his fears regarding human population growth. Hardin cited the fate of common grazing grounds, those pastures open to all but owned by nobody. Without malicious intent, acting only in their own self-interest, every herder would seek to maximize the size of their herd, adding more sheep and cattle. In aggregate, the herders will eventually overgraze the commons, causing it to become useless. Certainly, large areas of the world have been turned from forests into deserts, and the cod in the Atlantic and salmon in the Pacific are endangered, as are many of the world's watersheds. Hardin concluded that without converting the commons into private property or invoking some kind of external regulation, humans will always despoil any common resource. Many years later, political scientist Eleanor Ostrom asked whether Hardin's conclusion that freedom in a commons brings tragedy to all is really true. What's, what's the evidence say? She examined data about attempts to organize institutions for collective action around commons dilemmas worldwide and throughout history. Water sharing associations in modern Los Angeles and ancient Spain groups who shared fishing, hunting, grazing, and forestry resources. Ostrom did find many failures to organize effective institutions, but also found many success stories. And most interestingly, for my inquiry, she found a small number of design principles that appear to be present in successful attempts and absent in failed attempts to govern commons. Today, we are seeing new commons, endangered by enclosure, overconsumption, and underprovision. For example, the privatization of scientific knowledge, the political conflicts over net neutrality, and politics of regulation of the electromagnetic spectrum are all commons problems. Can these frontiers and previously unconnected disciplines be mapped onto a broad interdisciplinary discourse of cooperation. In biology, the mechanisms of symbiosis, group selection, and evolutionary psychology are still hotly contested, but there is little argument that cooperative arrangements have moved from a fringe role to a far more significant place in explanatory frameworks, from molecular biology to ecology. In economics, experiments with prisoners' dilemma and public goods games have provided evidence that humans do not always act in strictly rational self-interest, but often act to punish cheating and encourage cooperation. Neurophysiological imaging has demonstrated significant activity in the brain's reward centers when people punish cheaters in these games. A finding that caused one prominent researcher to remark that, quote, altruistic punishment may be the glue that keeps societies together, unquote. This sounds simple, and the word cooperation sounds too altruistic to describe the self-interest that so often drives it. But we're learning from this disparate knowledge that there are tools available that we all know about that enable people and organizations to compete for limited resources. And there are tools we are now just learning about that can vastly increase the amount of resources available to all. Mass collaboration has moved from an esoteric ideal of a community of enthusiasts to a lucrative business model for some of the largest businesses in the world. In regard to internet-based phenomena, the mass media have recently begun to recognize 
the epical changes represented by mass collaboration in business, culture, and media. There are more than 70 million blogs in the world today, and YouTube alone serves more than 100 million videos each day. Toyota treats its suppliers as a network instead of a market. IBM and Sun open source their software. Big pharmaceutical companies create problem-solving commons. Some of the most competitive companies in the world are embracing cooperative strategies that would have been unthinkable a few years ago. IBM took their open source support services from 0% of their revenues to their major source of revenue in four years. And they did it in large part by open sourcing billions of dollars of formerly proprietary software. Eli Lilly spun off Innocentive as an online marketplace for solutions to scientific problems, which would have been unheard of just a few years ago in the notoriously secretive pharmaceutical world. Almost immediately after opening this marketplace, a pharmaceutical chemist found that a petroleum chemist in Kazakhstan had solved a difficult synthesis he was seeking, necessary for creating a medicine. In the technology business, the open source movement showed that world-class software like Linux and Mozilla could be built without the bureaucracy of a firm or traditional market incentives. Google and Amazon built fortunes by drawing on, even by improving the Internet, by facilitating and building on the collective actions of millions of web publishers and reviewers. Amazon Shops enriched Amazon while enriching tens of thousands of partners. Google's AdSense creates wealth for Google and for hundreds of thousands of bloggers. eBay's online reputation system an online matching of sellers with buyers enables a multi-billion dollar market to exist where none had been possible before. Because every unsecured transaction is a prisoner's dilemma where mistrust prevents both buyers and sellers from acting. Knowledge collectives are springing up. Thousands of volunteers have contributed more than one million articles in more than 200 languages to Wikipedia, a free internet-based encyclopedia. Sharing economies facilitated by resource-linking computer networks emerge daily. ThinkCycle networks design students around the world to solve pressing practical problems in developing countries, like developing an inexpensive hydration system for cholera victims at a fraction of the cost of previously designed systems. Millions of people have pooled the computer power of their individual PCs to help create new medicines, crack codes, forecast the weather, or search for life in outer space. Click workers analyze Martian photographs for NASA. When Microsoft scientist Jim Gray when missing at sea, the community of his friends in the scientific and technology research community enlisted their friends from around the world to search for Gray. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and NASA used images from NASA satellites and high-altitude aircraft to acquire fresh images from the area where Gray disappeared. Amazon engineers split the image into manageable chunks and uploaded them to their Mechanical Turk system that already enables large numbers of people to contribute labor to large repetitive tasks. More than 12,000 people inspecting more than half a million images forwarded images of possible interest to experts for intensive review within just a couple of days. With the advent of affordable and powerful tools for creating audio, video, and web-based software services, and the ability to use the Internet as a global, instantaneous, 
many-to-many -many distribution and communication system, the division of cultural production into a large population of passive consumers and a small number of active producers has rapidly transformed into a world where a large population of cultural producers co-create cultural productions. A Pew Internet survey in 2005 found that more than 50% of American teenagers had created as well as consumed digital content. Those enterprises that have succeeded in the private and public spheres are those that have created platforms for participation and lowered the barriers to mass collaboration by those outside the boundaries of their enterprises. I think technologies of cooperation and the sharing economies they enable are only possible because the underlying technologies have certain key characteristics that link to human social capabilities. There are probably more than six of these, and each of these categories is worthy of its own more extensive investigation. Three years ago, I teamed up with the Institute for the Future to develop an interdisciplinary study of cooperation and collective action, the Cooperation Project. We've created the foundation for an online knowledge community, including a knowledge base consisting of one sentence, one paragraph, and one page summaries of key documents in cooperation studies. The visual interface is meant to serve as an entrance to this content for an online knowledge community. These 60 summaries provide the knowledge foundation of beginning cooperation studies. We also have a small library of video lectures from a course we taught at Stanford, featuring different kinds of cooperation experts, including Wikipedia's Jimmy Wales and prediction market expert Bernardo Huberman. Ultimately, we would like to foster a community of experts across disciplines and practices to build this out to hundreds and thousands of theoretical and practical findings, along with reputation mechanisms to enable seekers to filter their views of this data. In a series of workshops, we developed a visual map in matrix form depicting the social levers in combination with technology enablers that make possible new forms of cooperation like open source production and smart mob activism. We were able to use web tools and services to mock up a prototype of an annotatable map by putting such a map on the Flickr service and using its annotation feature to link hotspots on the map to external websites, including our videos, in addition to commentary by the annotating community. Knowledge that emerges from a convergence of disciplines requires what is known as a boundary object, like these maps, for people to focus on and use as a collective thinking tool. A map is a visual abstraction we know how to use. This one is a provisional starting place for discussion of how the foundational knowledge can be mapped. For example, a simple pie wedge chart can represent different disciplines. Particular findings, problems of cooperation, theories, can fall within or across sections, or sometimes in multiple sections. Another form of mental map involves using concentric circles to represent different levels of analysis of related phenomena, here representing subtopics of the social dilemmas that cluster levels of social organization that emerge in response to those dilemmas. Put them together and we defined an interdisciplinary landscape, a boundary object. To explore, move your mouse around, and when your mouse moves over a hot spot, a title and one sentence definition of one of the foundational documents appears. Hold the mouse button down and a one paragraph definition appears. Click again and summon an entire page with summary, source publication information, links to related documents, and links to discussions. The map 
can also be layered with different kinds of media, including images, audio, and video. The knowledge commons for cooperation studies, or for any discipline or group of disciplines, should include a variety of media. Cooperation researchers in different disciplines can make arguments about repositioning items and about the map itself. Understanding the complexities of human cooperation across disciplines necessitates not only visual representations to help clump abstractions, but multiple representations. The first maps we create are not intended as endpoints, but as starting places and shared thinking objects for interdisciplinary groups to begin understanding one another. Next, we seek to create an easy interface and tools for users to roll their own representations. The Knowledge Commons grows with the addition of pointers to source documents in multiple media, summaries and discussions of source documents, learning paths and connecting narratives, like this one, and visual representations of the information in the Commons. People should be able to add items, others should be able to rate those items, and each reader should be able to choose their own filter. We have a database of 60 entries right now, linked with keywords, disciplines, and what we call levers and lenses. Most recently, together with Charlotte Hess of the Indiana University Workshop on Political Theory and Policy Analysis, the Cooperation Project is initiating a searchable database of signals related to new commons. This is a listing of signals and the tag cloud that emerges as a population of contributors adds more signals. A signal is very much like a blog post with more structure than the usual blog post about an early indicator of a new commons issue. As a population of contributors adds signals, the tags they assign to entries begin to build a tag cloud, in itself a limited lens. Together with other visual representations, tag clouds enable people to find patterns that are not necessarily visible in more abstract reports, like data matrices. If you want to build a bridge, knowing something about mathematics and the nature of different materials is going to amplify your capability. If you want to cultivate crops, understanding the constituents of fertile soil is going to be useful. Similarly, whether your enterprise is global warming, microfinance, disaster response, conflict resolution, sustainable development, responsive politics, citizen journalism, mass collaboration. Understanding the dynamics of cooperation and collective action ought to be able to multiply your effectiveness. We've been working for the past three years on the foundations for what we think of as a cooperation academy. In the true sense of the word, a knowledge community of people dedicated to understanding theory, tools, and practices. Effective action is informed by a learning practice that integrates content, knowledge from different disciplines, with tools and media that enable more effective trust multiplication, social accounting, and collective intelligence systems. Along with the methods of using this content and these tools and media to inform one's own specific action in the world. We believe that by both teaching and learning from practitioners, creating an international interdisciplinary cooperation academy could establish a virtuous circle. Teaching practitioners about cooperative strategies could lead to their applications of those strategies in their work and their experiences in the field with what works and what doesn't work in application will inform future pedagogy. There was a time in which people thought diseases were caused by evil spirits or foreigners. Eventually, science and biology and microscopes led to the understanding that diseases were caused by microorganisms in, in food or water. I believe that in terms of understanding exactly how it is people do things together and how we fail to cooperate, we're about at the pre-microscope level of cooperation studies. There's no guarantee that knowing more 
will cause us to act more effectively or more humanely. But I believe that in the absence of that knowledge, we're doomed to flail around without really discovering the solutions to so many of the problems that affect all of us today. 